We are still in our sermon series, Handle Money Like a Grown-Up. We're in part three today, and today is the day. Uh, today we're going to talk about giving. Um, so if you are thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, this is the one I should have missed. Well, now, now you're here, so we're going to talk about it. Uh, get comfortable. Um, we're going to talk from the Bible, uh, uh, always, as we always do, seeking to understand what it is that God has for us. Permit me to pray. I'm going to pray briefly, and we're going to jump in. We're going to move very quickly, because we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. And so, Father God, we need you. Would you move in this place in such a powerful and profound way that it would be evident that, God, you are here. Uh, all of us are in desperate need of a Savior. Would you meet us where we are? And as we unpack what it means to give, and not just give, but to give generously, would you make it real for us? God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, um, there's this quote that I've kind of given to you uh, over the weeks, and I'm going to give it to you again in uh, our introduction. Um, it's by John Wesley, and in many ways sums up our entire sermon series. John Wesley says this. He says, get all you can without hunting your soul, your body, or your neighbor. Save all you can, cutting off every needless expense. Give all you can, be glad to give, and ready to distribute, laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that you may attain eternal life. And so here's what we've said. That at the end of all of this, my hope is that you would save more than you've ever saved in your entire life. That you would give more than you've ever given in your entire life. And that you would make more than you've ever made in your entire life. And so today we're talking about uh, what it means to give more. What it means to be a generous giver. Now uh, here, when we talk about giving here at Rooted Fellowship, we say we believe God calls us to be generous and when we give financially, we do so with our first and best because God gave us his first and best in Jesus. We say that every week, every week. And so here's the question, why? Why do we say this? And, and, and then where do we get this from? I'm so glad you guys asked. We get it from the Bible, like everything that we have, we get from the Bible. We get from God's word. We can trace first and best all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. But before we go there, and we will, I must lay down some foundation. Right? I must set the tone. There's a lot that we need to understand before we get to Genesis 4. And so in many ways, my, my sermon technically is about 10 minutes long. But I need to set some foundation that's going to take us about 30 minutes, okay? So that's, that's where we're going. We anchor our call to generosity in the beautiful truth that God is, hear this, God is first. God is first. And not only that, he gave us his very best. We anchor our call to generosity in those two beautiful truths, that God is first and he gave us his very best. He gave us himself in the second person of the Trinity. He gave us Jesus Christ. But don't just take my word for it. Let's, let's, let's look at God's word. Let's take God's word for it, that he is first, that's our first point, and that he gave us his very best. And so we respond to that. N number one, God is first. We see this in Genesis chapter one, verse one. We go right to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in the beginning, God it is no accident that God is the subject of the first sentence of the Bible. Yeah. For, for this word dominates the whole chapter and catches the eye at every point and at every page. If you believe, if you believe Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, then you really have no problem in believing the rest of the Bible. Yeah. That it begins there. It begins with God. The, the, the God who is big enough to have created the heavens and the earth is big enough to do all the rest that the Bible has to say about who he is and what he does. God, in the beginning, positions himself as first because he is first. Yeah, amen. The Holy Spirit is also there. He's also there. Because he's part of the Trinity. Genesis 1 verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty. 
darkness covered the surface of the water depths, the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. We see that the Holy Spirit is there as well. And so now we just need one more person of the Trinity, and then it's a party. And guess what? He's there. Jesus was present in the beginning. Where? Where? On our way. Genesis 1, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The, the plural pronouns, uh, pronouns, us and our, indicate that all three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, were involved in creation in the beginning telling us that they are first. But you might say, oh, honor, that's a bit of a leap. It doesn't say Jesus there. So, so can we really be sure that, that Jesus is part of the us? Well, let's ask the Bible. Right here at Root Fellowship, we say the Bible interprets the Bible. If you have a question about the Bible, then go to the Bible yep. to seek answers. And so let's do that. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and yet darkness did not overcome it. Then we jump to verse 14 of the same chapter. The Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Some translations said that he moved into the neighborhood. We observed his glory. The glory as the one and only who? Who? Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. And so there it is. Jesus was there. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right there in the beginning. Telling us that they are first. I love what Paul says in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. I love this passage of Scripture. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body, telling us that he is first even in this church. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. And then hear this, so he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. God is first. In all three persons of the Trinity, God is first. First, and so we must respond to that. That's point number one. As we seek to understand this call to be generous in our giving, we must understand that God is first. And not only that, but point number two, that He gave us His best. God is first, and He gave us His best. Many of us are familiar with John chapter 3, verse 16. Which says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 and 8 says this way. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The old NIV translation says it this way. But God demonstrates his own love for us by giving, by giving us his very best, and that is Jesus Christ. And so, friends, we should 
we should daily consider the generosity involved in the act of giving that happened on the cross. That, that it should never get old. And so for many of us, we, we, we treat this like, oh, no, I know this, get to the meatier stuff. This is the meatier stuff. We should daily, we should daily, daily, daily consider God's generosity in giving us his son. A king came and died for our sin. Oh, this is so good. So good. It, it, like it's, it's so overwhelming. This, this gift is, is beyond measure. Beyond measure. The, 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 the greatest act of generosity towards us. D Daniel M. Bell Jr., he's a, an author and professor, he, he says this on this matter. He says, Christ's work on the cross is a display of the plentitude. And for that word, school is not over, overrated. We, we, thank, we thank the schooling system. Christ's work on the cross is a display of the plentitude of divine charity, of God's giving and giving again. The Atonement, and we covered this in We Are All Theologians, uh, the word atonement is the process by which an obstacle is removed so that reconciliation can occur. And so the atonement is not a settling of accounts, an exaction of payment, or the calling in of a debt. Rather, it is a matter of God's ceaseless generosity, of God's graceful prodigality which simply means God's extravagance, extravaganza. That's what it means. It is a, a matter of donation, of divine donation for our sake. Thus, Christ is not an, our offering to God, but God's offering to us. Oh, friends, may this never get old. May this never get old. That the Father has given us a king and a kingdom in Jesus Christ. A king and a kingdom in Jesus Christ. W what a gift. What a gift. The, the Swedish uh, preacher and poet Karl uh, Bobach wrote the great hymn, How Great Thou Art. And in there we, we sing, And when I think... That God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can't take it in. That on a cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Th that's the response. That's the res then sings my soul. And I get it. Like, I get it. Sometimes we walk in here and we're like, you know, I just don't feel like singing. Oh, no, I'm not in a good place. Oh, no, I feel like the world is on my shoulders. You know what? This week was horrible. I, I get that. And so, you know, one of the reasons that we gather is to be reminded of the greatest gift that we've ever received. And so in that moment, you need to speak to your soul. Yeah. Then, hey, soul... D David does this. Hey, soul, sing. C can I say this real quick? Unexpressed gratitude is pretty much useless. And I know some of us were like, you know, but oh, no, I, just, I just don't do that. I just don't do that, you know. It's my, my personality. Your personality's got nothing to do with it. Your Enneagram number's got nothing to do with it. Yeah. Whether, whether you're like an introvert, extra, I get, I'm the, one of the biggest introverts you'll ever meet. And I know it's shocking. Because you'll be like, but only I see you every Sunday. Because I, I, I scarce can't take it in. Unexpressed gratitude is pretty much useless. You, you, speak, you speak to a wife. Husband ro rocks up. Oh, you know, I just, I love you. I care for you so much. Let me show you why. Step one, step two, step three. This is what I do. Do you not feel loved? 
You, you tell me how that goes for you. No, it's, it's, it's I just, I, I can't wait to be with you. I can't, I can't wait to wrap my arms around you. And, and kids, are, kids are exactly the same. Like, like my, my little girls will, will bring a picture and like, it, like, it's no Mona Lisa. Like, I know that. But when I receive it, I, I, there's two ways I could respond. This is incredible. I like the way that your pen made a mark here. It's great use of colors. Pretty impressive for a six-year-old. Or, or do I go, this is the greatest picture I've ever seen in my life. I'm a little offended by that. <clears throat> Don't know how to deal with that one. But, but, but there's this, there's this joy, there's this joy, there's this joy, there's this, there's this joy, there's this, there's this joy, and, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we've made this too common. Because we live in a context where, like, no one's gonna run in here, like. The police aren't going to run in here and arrest us because we're doing this. Yeah. And so in some ways, this is easy. I don't know for how much longer. I don't. I don't. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. I, I, I can't get over the gospel. Because of, because, of, because of who has been given to me. And not just for salvation, but for sanctification that leads to glorification. I know how the story ends. God is first. And he gave us his best in Jesus. And so our only response should be to reorient our lives so that it is evident that God is first in our lives because he gave us the very best. That's the response. First and best. This first and best should be in everything. It should be. It should be in everything. And included in that everything is our money. Yeah. Now, that's what what Mpumi said was right. Time, talent, and treasure. You don't get to pick one. Because when you do that, you treat God like a part-time lover. And he is not that. It's in everything, and that includes our money. In fact, our money is a, is a powerful demonstration of whether this is true. That God deserves our first and our best. We covered this in part one of our sermon series. About the, the, the powerful grip that money can have over our hearts. And that when we surrender this part of our lives to God, it reveals that God is ultimately our treasure. Yeah. And not money. In Malachi chapter three, when God is calling the people to repentance... Look what he says to them. Malachi chapter 3 from verse 6. It says, Because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Oh, I mean, I, I think if, if it was possible for God to change his mind about us, he might have. And we would be finished. Oh, but thank God that he does not change. He does not change. I mean, imagine you were sitting in the throne where God sits. Con constantly engaging. Constantly engaging with humanity. I will never do it again. I promise. Two hours later, I'm so sorry. God, forgive me. Oh, I'm so, I'm so thankful that he, he does not change that his promises remain the same. They are truth. They are yes and amen in Christ. Amen. Verse seven, since the days of your ancestors, you have turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of armies. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God? 
yet you are robbing me. How do we rob you, you ask? By not paying the payments of the tenth and the contributions. God is calling them to repentance, and in doing so, he talks about money. See, they, they forgot that everything belongs to God. They started to make a little money. They bought their first nice house, really nice car. They got that promotion at work. And they started looking in the mirror a little bit too long and believed the lie that I own everything, that it's mine. And yet Leviticus says this, Leviticus 25, 18 to 23. I'll read some of it. It says, You are to keep my statutes and my ordinances and carefully observe them so that you may live securely in the land. You want to live securely in the land? Obey God. Then the land will yield its fruit so that you can eat, be satisfied, and live securely in the land. Jump all the way to verse 23. The land is not to be permanently sold because it is mine. You know when you get way too comfortable and you're like, you know, this is mine. I can do with it whatever I want. God's going, no, 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 no. I know your heart. I know your heart. It is not to be permanently sold because it's mine. And you are only aliens and temporary residents on my land. That's a big one. That's a big one. Let's go back to Malachi. Verse 9, it says, you are... Suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. See, God, God, God called it robbery because they had unlawful, they had an unlawful possession of what belonged to God. It wasn't because only the tithes and offerings belonged to God. In fact, it was because everything belongs to God. He's making the point Everything is mine. God says, bring the tenth. Bring the tenth. Let's do a little bit of English here. It doesn't say give the tenth. See, the way we use the English language in our culture and society today is is that when we say give give me, that, it's almost like it's yours. So could you please give it to me? But if I say, hey, bro, bring my stuff. Bring, bring my, bring my, that, that's, that's what's being communicated here. B- bring, bring the tenth. And then he allows us to keep the rest as managers. You're still not an owner. As managers. Remember, when we give a, a tithe, that is 10% of your income or assets to God, It isn't as if the remaining 90% is yours to do with it as you please. It all belongs to God. He just allows us to directly manage that 90%. It's the stewardship principle. He says in verse 10, Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. They belong to what the Lord calls my house. My house. I said this last week. This is not my church. It's God's church. You you are not my people. You are God's people. This vision, this vision, it's not my, it's God's vision. It's God's mission. All of it belongs to God. The the gifts that you possess, they are God's gifts. And so the money that you have, the assets that you have, they are God's. Now, I could say a whole lot about the storehouse and what that means, and, 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 and we can jump into that. But I want you to know that it all belongs to God, and it's for the purposes of advancing his kingdom, making yeah. him known. Right? There's a quick summary. Now, we, we could go read it. And, and Moses, he, he gets real deep into, like, what it's for and what it looks like and what it's yeah. about. But, but, but let me sum it up. for It's for advancing God's kingdom, making him known yeah. so that we might enjoy him forever. Like I said, so much could be said about this. So much could be said about this. But here's the biblical call. We're called to give. And when we give, that is an act of worship. We're called to give. And when we give, that is an act 
of worship. Because it communicates that God, you are my treasure. And I trust you. I trust you. I trust you more than what's in my bank account. I trust you more than what's my investment. God, I trust you. I trust that you are the one who will provide. And so the question is, do you trust him? It's easy to amen these things, but do you trust him? Here's what God, God says. Test me in this way. Oh my goodness. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Test me in this way. The the New Living Translation says it this way. It says, I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Who wants that? Some of y'all are still wrestling through it. Like, oh, you know, let me look at my balance sheet. I don't know. The ESV says it this way, open the windows of heaven for you and and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Test me and bring me what belongs to me and then watch what I will do. Uh, Guys, I wish, I wish. A couple of years ago, my, my wife decided to take God at his word and test him because he says, test me. And, and the, testimony that, the testimonies that we have of God's goodness, of God's goodness, they are, my wife will tell you, I mean, she's, we spoke about it, part one, Excel spreadsheet, she has all the numbers, everything, what are we paying for, what are we, and she would do that, and it got to a point where she, her words, it got to a point where she went, you know what, this doesn't add up, it doesn't make sense. The the things that that we're able to do, we should not be able to do them. It's the Lord. And He's not going to provide in the... That's the problem with us. It's like, you know, God, you need to provide and you need to stay in this lane. God goes, excuse me? Yeah, no, you need to provide like this way. Step one, step two, A, B, C. And God goes, no, 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 I don't operate that way. I will provide for you in ways that you could have never imagined. And that's how it happens. You, you, you take a step of faith. We're all hoping for a miracle. I say it all the time. We're hoping for a miracle. Your miracle is waiting for you on the other side of your step of faith. This is a step of faith. And God, God will do more than you could ever imagine. But I get it. Some of y'all are like, oh, this is bragging. No, it's a testimony. It's a testimony. Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your vine in your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. It's one of those situations where the, the, the world is looking at the church wondering what on earth is going on here? Because economically, this shouldn't be happening. Politically, this shouldn't be happening. It's because we operate from a different kingdom. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of armies. People will want to be a part of what's happening here. And when they ask the question, how is this possible? We we don't say me. We point to the Lord. And we say, you just simply have to put your trust in him and watch him work. Now, some of us will say this about the tithe, right? We hear the word tithe and we go, oof, on air. That's an Old Testament thing. Jesus came and died and established a new covenant. And in that new, we don't really have to give. I've heard it. I've heard it being said. I want to tell you this morning that that is false. It's false. I would say, in fact, I would say, that the new covenant raises the stakes on this issue. Let's read a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about giving. He says, now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, 
oh, so money's been collected. You should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. So this isn't just a one church thing. This is multiple churches. On the first day of each week, oh, okay, first day, now they were gathering on a Sunday, right? They used to gather on Saturday, but now they gather on a Sunday because the Lord rose on the Sunday. So they want to gather and celebrate that. There it is. You should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Just want to let you know, uh, Corinthians is in the New Testament. I might, have, that, that might have, I might have forgotten to say that one. There we go. There we go. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, you know what that's like, huh? Oh, yeah, she's going to, he's going to ask about it. I didn't uh, quickly. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you chose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. The messengers you chose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. Okay, there it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We could go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 9, which comes after 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, I wish I had time to unpack everything that's going on here, but let me just quickly highlight this. Paul is talking about giving and, and money that had been promised, and now he speaks on the collection of that money. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. One to six. Let me read this and then I'll get to what I want to highlight on. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe trial brought by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I can testify that according to their ability and even beyond their ability of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints. And not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. So we urge Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. Let me jump over to verse 6. Paul says, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 6. The point is this. Now, whenever the Bible says the point is this. Because I know, like sometimes you'll read verses in the Bible. There was a man who had a field. And upon that field he gave and then sowed another field and took a sheep and then ran away. Like you're just like, I have no, like what, what, is that, what does that even mean? But when it says the point is this. Oh, he's, he's, he's about to be clear. He's like, listen up. The point, the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. I read this and, and noticed a couple of things. One of the things that stood out to me is that I see that Paul doesn't give like the, the details of like, hey, step one, step two, step three of giving. It's like he almost jumps in. He's like, all right, guys, regarding money, here's what we're doing. He goes straight in. Why does he do this? Well, it's because all of that, all the step ones and step twos and ABCs, all of that was covered by Moses and the law. Yeah. And so Paul is assuming that you've read it. And so the question this morning is, have you read it? I, I, think, I think for many of us, many of us, like when, when, we, when we yell like, oh no, this is, this is Old Testament, this is Old Covenant, this is, you know, like yeah, you know, I, I doubt we've even read the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. I, I had to do some reading myself. And so Paul assumes that you've read it. That's why he just goes straight in. Paul is like, we've, we've covered the foundations and what was done in anticipation of Jesus coming. But friends, he has come and died for you and me, satisfying the wrath of God. And then he rose from the grave, defeating sin, death, and Satan. 
And, and for you, for you who have surrendered your life to him, for, for you who say, this is my king, this is my Lord, then he goes, okay, now let's talk about giving. On that basis, now let's talk about giving. With that foundation, now let's talk about giving. And here's what we can learn from Paul's directions to the churches on the matter of giving. Right? Here's what we can learn. From 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we're informed that our giving should be periodic, which means it must be done at regular periods. It must be planned. So that means it must be thought of in advance and that it must be proportional. That we must give in proportion to our blessings. That's what we learn. But there's more. We also learn from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that we must be generous that's giving more rather than less, that it must be freely given, so not done out of guilt or manipulation, and so by no means am I trying to guilt you into anything. That's why I started with the beauty of the gospel, and that we must give cheerfully, given with a rejoicing heart. See, New Testament giving is an act of worship in response to what Jesus has done for you. The, the overflowing generosity of the Father through the Son by the power of the Spirit should compel us to be ridiculous in our giving. It should give us a, a, a posture that just wants to generously give in all of life, and this includes our resources. It should stir in us a desire to give our first and best. Our first and our best. Now, now that we have unpacked all of that, okay? Now that I've kind of laid down some foundation, remembering that God is first and that he gave us his best, and so we give our first and our best in response to that, here's where we get our language when we say we're called to give our first and best because God has given us his first and best in Jesus. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Verse 1. The man, this is Adam, was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said... I have made a male child with the Lord's help. So she also gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. Okay, he was into agriculture. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The New Living Translation says it this way, Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. Abel brought his first and best. Now, let's keep in mind that what we've just read, this is before the Apostle Paul in his words to the church. It's before the prophet Malachi. It's before Moses and the law. It's even before Abraham and Melchizedek, when Abraham gave a tenth as an offering to this priest king that we find in Genesis 14. It's way before all of that. Solidifying it as a biblical principle. Abel had enough sense to understand that God is first and that one day he will give his best. There was, there was enough there to grasp that. I don't, I don't know, maybe it was in conversations with his parents, Adam and Eve, going, you know what, there used to be a time where we used to walk with God. And then we sinned. And then he made a promise to us that one day he will restore that. And so Abel is living in light of that promise. And he says, you know what, God is first. And one day he's, he's going to give us, he's going to give us something, something so good that it's going to restore this relationship. And so my response is to give our first and best. With that amount of knowledge, Abel does this. How much do you and I know? The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. What's the difference here? Why does God prefer, or as the text says, regard Abel's offering and have no regard for Cain? Well, it's because God... Uh, I wrote you real quick. It's, it's maybe because God prefers meat over. But that's not, no. That's not, that's not what's going on here. That's not, those are just notes. Those are scribbly notes. Scribbly notes. It's because, and let me put it plainly, it's because Cain, Cain, Cain gave God his leftovers. He, he counted his harvest, 
looked at it, counted it all up, and then set aside the first and best and kept that for himself and then gave God what was left. The offering of Cain would have been more aesthetically pleasing to the eyes. I mean, think about it for a moment. You know, beautiful fruits and vegetables and probably laid in a nice little kind of presentation. It would have been aesthetically beautiful to the eyes. While Abel's would have been a bloody mess. Blood everywhere, bodies everywhere. Oh, and if I had time, if I had time, does this not point us to the cross? The, the cross was not aesthetically pleasing to the eyes. And yet the power that it has. See, God was more concerned with f- the faith in the heart than the exterior beauty. God is more concerned with a heart that is in awe of him and what he has done that drives us to worship. He's more concerned with that than, 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 than how we pretend and perform. Yeah. Abel, Abel looked for the first and best and surrendered that to God. In fact, we can say Abel's offering, hear this, was a first fruit faith offering. Yeah. Let me say that again. It was a first fruit faith offering because he had no idea what would come after the first and best. But he trusted God for provision. First fruit faith offering. This is why the writer of Hebrews points to this in Hebrews 11 verse 4. He says, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. And so which one are you? Cain or Abel? Cain sees that that his offering is not regarded by God and so has a sour face. Verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? And why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you, won't you be accepted? Yeah. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. See, the sin at the door of Cain's heart, it was a, 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 the beast within. The beast within, and he continually feeds it. Cain stood at the edge of unending darkness, But sadly, God's clear words about sin as a crouching beast simply bounced off his hardening heart. And in monumental willfulness, he began to descend into the pit. Him and those who would follow after him. You have no idea how dangerous this is. Not just for you, but for those who will come after you. And it's weird. It's weird. Like when we talk about this, I said this the other day to my wife that, 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 Generosity seems wasteful to the stingy. And so we get upset. We get upset not realizing that sin is doing something in our hearts. My friend Joby Martin says this. He says, when we think about stuff, money and resources, there's, there's three ways that we can navigate through it. We can say, what's mine is mine. Well, that's selfish. We can say, what's mine is yours. Well, that's stealing. But when we say, what's mine is God's, well, that's stewardship. And my hope is that we would be stewards of what God has given us. Blown away by what he's done for us, that we just become generous with everything that we have. And so one of the ways to figure out which one you are is to examine your giving. It's to examine your giving. Are you Cain or are you Abel? Okay. Whew, that's a lot. All right? Like, I know that's a lot. And so how do we respond to this? Well, examine your heart. Friends, let's examine our hearts. Search me, O oh Lord. God, you are first in my life. My hope is that that would be your response. God, you are first in my life. Or has something else taken your place? 
Do I give you my first and best? Or is that going somewhere else? We, we, we're all givers. And we're all actually very generous. Tremendously generous. The question is, what are you giving to? Who are you giving to? We can give out of reason or out of revelation. And both of those are good. But one led by the other is better. Re reason is this. Reason is this. Is to, is to go, okay, let me look at my trial balance and all that and sell spreadsheets and how much comes with like, like and I'm, that's it's important. You, sh you should be doing that. Re revelation is to go, here's what God has done. Here's what he has done for me. He sent his son, Jesus. He gave me his very best. And so what is my response to that? Reason says one plus one is two. But in the kingdom of God, one plus one can be three, can be 3,000, can be three million. God is not bound by what we experience and what we go through. And so will you give out of revelation? We bring our first and best because God gave his first and best in Jesus. And friends, aren't we glad that Jesus didn't tithe his blood? I mean, the mere, the mere fact that he just goes, bring, bring the tenth. Oh, I'm, I am so thankful.